I'm your host, Dr. Joe Dispenza. When people are under the gun of those chemicals, they're drawing from this invisible field of energy surrounding their body, this vital life force, and they're using it to make chemistry, and the field around their body shrinks, and they become more matter and less energy, more particle and less wave. And the very hormones of stress heighten our senses so that we become a materialist. And the more altered we feel from that stress response or by the emotional reaction from some threat or danger, the more we narrow our focus on the cause or the object. And when we do that, all of a sudden, we are focusing only on matter. And so people, over time, get hooked in or habituated into narrowing their focus. So then when you're living in emergency mode, it's not a time to create. It's not a time to open your heart. It's not a time to learn anything new. It's not a time to sit still and go within. In fact, if the survival gene is switched on, you'd be thinking at some level innately that it's not a time to sit still because you would be prey. So then the more people are conditioned or addicted to the hormones of stress, the more their attention is on matter, the more they begin to experience separation from everyone and everything. Now, if stress is created by the feeling that you're losing control in your life, that you can't predict an outcome, or you have the perception that something or someone is causing situations in your life to get worse, then if you're living by the hormones of stress on a daily basis, then what we try to do is we try to control everything in our life when we're feeling loss of control. We try to predict the next moment based on our memories of the past. That means people under stress are craving the known. They're trying to get back to the familiar or the known because in survival, the unknown is a scary place. So then as they begin to shift their attention from one person to one problem to another person to another problem to another thing to another place, each one of those elements has a neurological network in the brain. And the arousal of those chemicals then begin to cause those different circuits as you shift your attention to begin to become highly activated. And now the brain is functioning in a very incoherent state. And the arousal of those chemicals drives the brain into a very, very highly analytical, overfocused state. Think about it. When you're under stress, have you noticed that you keep thinking about the same problem over and over again? Because the very hormones of stress cause you to narrow your focus on the cause, because that's what you do when you're living in survival. And in fact, out of the infinite possibilities that exist in your reality, when people are addicted or living in that stressful state, they'll always select the worst case scenario in their mind and prepare for the worst. Well, why is that? Because in survival, if you prepare for the worst, anything less that happens, you have a better chance of surviving. So people spend the majority of their life preparing for the worst thing that could happen to them when they're living in the stressful state. And it turns out, that 70% of the time, most people are living in survival. So then, when you react to someone or something, there's a refractory period of chemicals that's created from your emotional reaction. And if you don't know how to regulate or stop that emotional reaction, and you keep that same reaction lingering for hours or days, that's called a mood. If you keep that same refractory period going for weeks to months on end, that's called the temperament. If you keep that same emotional reaction going on for years on end, that's called the personality trait. And most people's personalities then are defined by experiences from the past. So now that you understand that stress is when the brain and body are knocked out of balance, and you understand that the hormones of stress push the genetic buttons and create disease, it begs the question, is there anyone or anything truly worth living in that state? So then, if people are living in chronic stress and they're drawing from this invisible field of energy surrounding their body and they're mobilizing that vital life force to make chemistry and the field around their body is shrinking, and they're feeling more like matter and less like energy, more like particle and less like wave, 
and they feel separate or disconnected from everyone and everything in their life. Well, when you're matter trying to change matter, we tend to force outcomes, control outcomes, try to predict outcomes, and there's only a certain number of resources that we have when we're matter trying to change matter. We'll compete, we'll fight for it, we'll manipulate, we'll try harder, we'll hope, we'll wish, because we're experiencing separation. And yes, you may accomplish your dreams, but if you're matter trying to change matter and all of your attention is on your body, the environment and time, then everything you create in your life will take time because you'll have to move your body through space. And when you move your body through space, it's going to take time for you to get what you want. So you may want a house, you may want a new car, you may want a new experience, a new vacation, but you're going to have to drag your body to work every day to make the money to pay for those things. And yes, you may arrive at your goals, but you may have to work harder and it may take some time to get it. There is another state of mind and body that you can live in, and that's called living in creation. And it's the exact opposite of living in survival. If the hormones of stress create incoherence in the brain, as well as incoherence in the heart, what we found is that when people are living by those states, what if they had the ability to go from a narrow focus, or what's called a convergent focus, to what's called a divergent focus, or a broad focus, or an open focus? And it turns out when people take their attention off their body, when they take their attention off the people in their lives, when they're no longer putting any attention on the things they own, like their cell phone, their computer, their car, they're not thinking about the place they need to go or the place they're sitting, and they're not thinking about time in and of itself. They are disinvesting all of their attention and all of their energy out of this three-dimensional reality because they have no attention on it. It makes sense then that they're beginning to change their brain state. So then we've taught people how to broaden their focus. And when they open their focus and sense nothing but space, when they open their awareness and they tune in to the energy or the frequency out here, and instead of putting their attention on matter, they're putting their attention on energy, the act of opening their awareness causes them to stop thinking, to stop analyzing. And if they're no longer thinking and they're no longer analyzing, they're no longer activating these circuits in the brain. All of a sudden, they begin to slow down brain activity and they start getting beyond their analytical mind. And as they suppress the neocortex, the memory bank of the autobiographical self, they begin to suppress everything known in their three-dimensional reality and they turn off the neocortex they begin to regulate their brain waves and slow them down, all of a sudden something magical happens. The act of opening their awareness causes different compartments of the brain that were subdivided like a house against itself, all of a sudden to begin to synchronize, to begin to unify. You start to seek neurons, beginning to join larger communities of neurons. And what was once an incoherent brain begins to become more organized and more coherent. Now, the chronic stress creates a thyroid condition called Graves' disease. And the person develops what's called myasthenia gravis. And the side effect of that, aside from a tremendous lack of energy, is double vision. Now, this person said, I've created this condition now that I understood that I've mismanaged my thoughts and feelings and my emotional reactions. If I created this condition by pushing the genetic buttons every single day, and it's taken me a couple years, I lost my marriage, I lost my business, I have to get beyond that story and I have to tell a new story. I have to start believing in my future more than I've been believing in my past. Is it possible then that I can begin to make those significant changes? And as the person started overcoming the stress hormones and taught her brain and body how to create coherence, the side effect of it was the body came back to balance. Her vision is now perfect, her thyroid hormones are moving back into balance, and she's moved her brain and body back into homeostasis. 
And in a sense then, she healed herself of the condition because her autonomic nervous system got back into doing its job, which is to create order and balance. So then, when we live in two states of mind and body, living in survival is living in our animal state. When we live in survival, we live in stress. And when we live in stress, there's contraction that takes place in the body. And because we're using a lot of the body's resources, we experience what's called catabolism or tissue breakdown. When the body's in that state, there's disease or imbalance. There's degeneration that takes place in the body. The emotions of fear, anger, sadness are the primary emotions of survival. The self comes first. When you're living in that state, all of your attention is on your environment, all of your attention is on your body, all of your attention is on time. There's always energy lost in the system. We're living in emergency mode. We're narrow focused or object focused. We experience separation. We're determining reality with our senses. In other words, if we can't see it, if we can't smell it, if we can't taste it, if we can't hear it, we can't feel it, it doesn't exist. We're living by cause and effect. We're waiting for our environment to change, to give us the relief from the discomfort that we're feeling inside of us. In survival and in stress, we don't see many possibilities because it's not a time to create. The brain and heart function in a very incoherent state. And in survival, we are craving the known because the unknown is just too much of a scary place. Now, when we begin to create the creative state, we could call that the divine aspect of us. In creation, the brain and body move back into homeostasis. There's an expansion of energy, a release of energy from the tissues. The body goes into anabolism or tissue repair. There's health, there's order, there's regeneration taking place in the body. Elevated heartfelt emotions like love, joy, trust, knowingness, gratitude, begin to mobilize all these new chemicals that begin to repair and regenerate the body. When we're in this heartfelt state, we tend to be less selfish and more selfless. We have our attention now no longer on our body, on the things in our life, the people in our life, on our environment or on time itself. Energy is always created in the creative process. There's growth and repair. We broaden or open our focus. And when we do that properly, we start feeling less separate and more connected to something greater. We start to imagine and dream of a reality beyond our senses. Now we're interested in causing an effect. We're looking at all possibilities instead of limited possibilities. The brain and heart go into coherence. And now the unknown becomes the adventure. And why is that important? Because if we're going to create something new in our life, we have to crave the unknown. Now that I've shown you the difference between living in survival and living in creation, I want to explore the different brainwave states and what you can do to use your mind to begin to consciously change your own brainwaves. In the next episode, I want to show you what's happening inside your head when you live in survival and when you live in creation. That is coherence versus incoherence.